Julia Wynn, Head of Marketing at Air Traffic Control. Thank you so much for being on the show and diving into a topic, ABM, that although is not new, I think is more relevant today than ever before, right? Especially in a world where spraying and praying and all that stuff, maybe we were able to get away with it for a little bit, but certainly not now. So really appreciate your time. Real quick, why don't you just tell folks a little bit about your career background, how you got to where you're at today? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Julia. I am the head of marketing at Air Traffic Control currently. I'm definitely admitted startup junkie. This is uh, gosh, going on, I think my sixth startup and prior to coming up to the Bay Area and kind of diving into all things startups, actually worked on in Los Angeles and Hollywood, got a film degree. So I think a lot of that kind of uh, understanding of persona and character from that world really helps me in this world in marketing. And I try to fuse the two together as much as I can. Awesome. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why you're such an awesome marketer, just like that diversity. You know, you've seen a lot of folks who I think maybe have historically entered technology and they were maybe more of a, you know, straight out of like college, got straight into tech and it was very tech oriented. And not to say that all of those folks were um, creatively not as deep but it, i think like when you see folks that have different types of backgrounds are able to pull from those especially you know your background like that pull from that creative energy and so yeah just that's also a shout out to to your work uh, as a marketer at air traffic control oh thank you absolutely well why don't we dive in to our favorite topic these days certainly as marketers who are trying to really be focused again not this spray and pray but just you know really dialing into uh, you know the ICP personas and being really really efficient with our efforts ABM you know and ABM again is that that idea of being strategically focused is not a new one certainly the technology and strategies that we've seen over the last several years are new what tips would you give marketers out there around effectively deploying that ABM campaign and, and maybe overarching strategy? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think first things first, like if we're not thinking of all marketing as ABM right now, what are we even really doing as marketers? And we've never had more tools at our disposal to kind of make these these really personalized journeys for ICP. We've never had as many tools as possible to kind of work with sales and analyze, you know, journeys and experiences and then apply that to our work as marketers. Um, but I also think there is a inflating of like all of the technology that is happening. And you don't necessarily need to have a $75,000 MarTech stack to enable ABM. I think like Ultimately, what it started as and where it is now is at the same point, which is listening to your customers, understanding what your real ICP looks like, not just people that come in and might be a customer, but your most successful champions, what makes them tick, where they live, where they breathe, what they you know read on the internet and all of those different things, I think is really, really important. So the better that we can know our customers um, and then apply that to new audiences, the more we can speak to personalized experiences. Question, if you are thinking about putting together, let's say this program, this ABM program from scratch, and you had to start with putting together a tech stack. And especially these days when, you know, budgets are a little tighter than maybe some of the last couple years, any sort of uh, must haves that you recommend that marketers really, really focus on? Yeah. I mean, First of all, I'll just say I'm a huge HubSpot fan. I feel like it just allows you to do a lot of things dynamically that other marketing automation platforms make a little bit more complicated than necessary. So um, I will have to mention ATC at some point because, you know, I think we are a fundamental part of the text. Let's do it. Let's dive in. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's dive in. Before I get into all of that, I'll tell you why I have to mention ATC. And then I'll also tell you 
that there's a lot of other things that kind of point into the pre, you know, evaluation process with tools like RB2B is really inexpensive and something that can give you insights into who is looking into you. Obviously doing customer interviews first, knowing the customer is always step one. Um, but I think where ATC comes in is in, in doing an ABM campaign, what is one of the most fundamental things that you know you're going to need? You're going to need content that speaks to that persona. You're going to have omni-channel content. It won't just be written things. We're not just talking about blogs. We're talking about webinars, podcasts, you know, enablement materials. And how do you know what should go to the right person or if you even created it yet? That's where ATC is really the first piece of the puzzle is in saying, my audience looks like this. This is how much content I actually have that's relevant to them. And then taking all that information and applying it to a content journey inside of HubSpot. Um, but that being said, we don't do everything. We're not a high, you know, uh, signal. I wouldn't call us like a signal provider. We don't do like intent data where we plug in is really on the content relevant side. And I think it's a much more affordable way to kind of make use of your existing resources. So, um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about us, but I think uh, it's definitely worth taking a look if you're a HubSpot customer, if you are robustly producing content for your ICP, or if you want to, then I think that we definitely deserve a second look. Question about ICP and the parameters. Mm -hmm. So what would you say if, if I had to put together that ICP profile, what are some must haves in terms of data points, right? Mm -hmm. Or let's say fields in a spreadsheet, right? That are mapping out that ICP that then you would use to map out the content strategy. Cause I think that's one thing that I've had many, many discussions around recently, which was, all right, well, how do we map our content to a buyer journey or do we set up the buyer journey based on the ICP and then map the content to that. Like I think people have, that I've spoken to recently are not struggling, but they're still trying to f kind of figure out which one is it. Yeah, well, I do like to use my kind of war room analogy here. So it's probably an appropriate place to dive in. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, which is when I was at, um, I think my second startup years ago at Waggle, and we were devising an ABM program when Sixth Sense was just coming on the scene and a couple other players. One of the things that we really did was go narrow. So in looking and talking to our own customers and actually studying our own data for you know months at a time, talking with sales, talking with product, we were able to identify the most successful niche group of customers, which in our area at the time was actually chief human resources officers at academic health centers. And that sounds really, really narrow, right? Like there's like only 50 to 75 within the United States, which is also the geography that we wanted to target. But we knew certain things about them. We knew that they were, you know, um, holding the keys for contracts for the entire human resources organization, which could span within an academic medical system, several hospitals, which makes it a very, very lucrative account. We knew that they were actively looking for technology that would help them promote patient engagement, uh, patient satisfaction and employee engagement. We knew that they, um, as I said, were in a certain geography. We knew what publications we read. Um, and we also knew from a product and a sales and a customer success point of view, that they were the ones that were most successful to go through their entire journey and get to a place of repeatable, non-churnable success. So they were the stickiest accounts that we could get in and the ones that understood and used us from a product perspective the most. So once we were able to really target that down and say, okay, each one of these systems is worth you know 50 to 75K in um, annual revenue, uh, which is a big price point, by the way, um, <laughs> much larger than where I'm at right now, we were able to really design a journey for them based on all of those things that used written content, events, communities, um, actual physical stuff that was sent to them. We made a really cool little uh, personalized stethoscope, if I recall, and sent that to all of these chief human resources officers. But the legwork had to happen first, and it had to happen through a series of trial and error of really analyzing our database, our data, our churn rate, um, our acquisition cost, and then saying like, okay, this is where we should invest to go all in on. And we didn't use any fancy 
signal platforms or anything else. This was all just derived from the data that we already had and then spread out into some other channels to reach these people. You mentioned journey. So I wanted to double click on that because as a sales person, and I've done like sales training for startup founders and early employees and stuff like that back in the day when I was in the Bay Area. And uh, it used to come out all the time that organizations had really well thought out sales processes, but that did not necessarily map to a buyer journey that was intelligently put together and literally based off of how their buyers buy. And it used to just drive me nuts. And, you know, I've talked about this many times. It's just like, no, I, I get your sales process. It's, it sounds really great. And you got a bunch of really cool tools, but is that how they buy? Is it mirroring the way that your ICP buys? And, uh, and most of the time they would be like, I, I don't know, you know? And mm -hmm. so I wanted to dive in real quick. What are some kind of, I don't know, maybe steps, stages, concepts that would be helpful for marketers out there to really make sure that they are thinking through the development or mapping of their buyer journey in an intelligent way? Yeah, I feel like a broken record. I am always saying this, but you have to listen to the other people on your team and have a positive culture. So especially with such a large ticket, like annual contract, like there's dozens of data points that go into that particular buyer and late stage prospect journey, which are really essential to study. And then if you're lucky enough to be able to do some customer retention marketing and really dive into it, kind of become a part of that team as well, understanding customer stories and how they have a marketing impact and understanding all of those little kind of conversion points that led to the point where someone was actually going to write you a check for, you know, five, six figures per year, then it really helps you understand how to address objections, not only within the sales cycle, but also time to value, speed to adoption within the platform. Um, with that one in particular, you know, we had a lot of a very robust customer success team um, it was kind of a standalone product. It didn't actually integrate with a lot of other systems. So education and getting people to the point where they were not only going to continue after a free trial, but like thrive after a free trial was really, really important because I think anyone, you know, still in marketing still knows like a raving customer base is absolutely the best sales tool that you can possibly have. Um, and we leveraged all of that into actually making a customer conference where those stories were being told live, pre-recorded and sent to other prospects. And it actually fueled our entire marketing department's uh, like collateral and programs for years to come, just based on you know a few happy customers with stories that were relatable to the few other people that we wanted to reach through our ABM motion. Awesome. I wanted to ask you about AI and you talked about the war room concept. How do you sort of bring those two together, like developing the war room? And maybe you can define that for the folks out there, what that looks like. And then how do you bring AI into the fold? Yeah. Well, so when I think of a war room in terms of like ABM, like I am actually thinking of kind of like America's most wanted, right? So you're actually getting a picture or something that represents this person. Maybe it's a picture of their health system. Maybe it's a picture of them. You're jotting down all those things we already talked about in terms of demographics, publications, key statistics about their organization, pain points, tech stack, all of those different pieces that make them the perfect, we actually called it healthcare's most wanted at Waggle, which I, I didn't all the way come up with, so I cannot take credit for it. Michael Pepe and I um, definitely put our heads together on that one. But that's what I think about. I actually always still visualize this room that we had where we put 50 pictures of individuals up around there and said, okay, we're 20% in on this one. We got a meeting in on this one, tracking all of those to the point where they would either decide to give us a try or they would say, you know what? No, it's not a good fit for us right now. That's okay. That's what you want. You want that actual text, like that input to say, it's not for them. Why is it not for them? Well, then it might not be for this person or how can we enable them to feel like it is for them in a way that we're not doing right now. So when it comes to AI and leveraging that now, there is obviously, like we said, kind of all of the um, data that's happening. If you're creating the right content on your website, RB2B, these kinds of tools can be identifying people that are coming on 
it could lead you astray potentially because maybe you're going to start being interested in someone else that's coming to your site and it doesn't fit into an ICP and maybe you want to create another ICP or do this or that. So I think you have to use that carefully. Um, I also think, you know, a lot of these other kind of signal providers are very interesting when it comes to, you know, providing different pieces of the puzzle that can maybe integrate and make a more complete picture of your prospects. And then touting just, you know, AI and content production a little bit. I think there is obviously a massive overuse. Anyone who's ever read an article or a blog piece or a LinkedIn post in the last year that's like, in our digital era, in our digital landscape, you're like, okay, ChatGPT wrote that. Um, and, you know, I think there's a massive overuse of that. Can ChatGPT and BARD and all these platforms be super, super effective for writing your meta descriptions, synthesizing your podcast, for doing outlines, for a dozen other things, probably infinitesimal other things. Yes, of course they can. But ultimately, at the core for ABM, again, content needs to be actually relevant and useful. And I don't think AI can do that in a human tone yet. So I still think humans need to be leveraging um, own human voices and subject matter experts to speak to people. Now, again, with ATC, can we use AI to then say, all of these pieces of content are relevant for people in bucket A. Yes, that's a great use for AI because we're not spending all that time creating dynamic tags or manually creating emails for people. AI is just putting the right content in front of the right people after a human has produced it. So it's all about balancing between those various pieces, in my opinion. You know, that's the second time in the last couple of days that I've heard someone speak to AI in that way. And that really resonates in that it's not, at least for the time being, it's not really replacing the human touch, right? Actually, it's Rand Fishkin. We, we had him on the show yesterday and I was asking him about the impact of AI on SEO and he basically had the same sort of thoughts that you did, right? It is that the tone and humanness of the content that we are writing is uh, is still needed, right? And and again, we don't, we no one ever says, "Oh, you know what? I want to read a generic blog post, right? That just sounds abstract and et cetera, et cetera, right?" And I think that organizations are picking it up. No one that we've seen, well, I, I suppose I, can, I, I can't really say that in totality. I would just say that maybe I haven't seen with my own experience using AI it to be superhuman. And it's really funny because anytime I've tested it out and I've sent it to Justin, my co-founder, who you know well, uh, he right away, he's like, oh, this is AI. I'm like, yep, it is. He, he <laughs> just knows, right? And I think we we all experience that. So that that very much resonates. Question about the alignment piece, because as we were kind of discussing when we were prepping for the conversation today, you could do all the right things, right? You can put together the right technology stack. You can put together really great copy and landing pages and all these other things that we do in, in ABM, right? Merchandise, right? Et cetera. But if sales is not aligned, if they're not bought in, if they don't understand the value that we bring, if they don't understand the way that they're supposed to work with us and vice versa, right? Then you're not really going to maximize your ABM campaigns and overall strategy. And it could not work, right? Because of the alignment piece. How do you properly align with sales? Yeah, I've spoken about this in a couple of different conversations recently and actually just had some other thoughts about it as it relates to ABM. But I think the first thing is, you know, the first thing a marketer should be doing when they join an organization is listening and joining in as on as many sales calls as possible. Um, and, you know, vice versa. I think that a salesperson joining an organization should be listening to as many customer calls as possible and, you know, listening to what messaging ideas marketing has that they think are going to resonate. Um, ultimately, a lot of the kind of push and pull, I think, still does come from that like old Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you know, like, you know, the leads are weak. No, you're weak, like mentality. And it doesn't work anymore. Like, 
I don't know, I'm similar to you. Like I'd rather work in a pleasant um, environment for sure. And that's not one that I want anything to do with because when there's all the hubris around attribution and everything else, things just get derailed really, really fast. And especially in an ABM motion, you know, marketing might be sending out all these campaigns and all these different signals to try to draw in that perfect ICP human. And if sales isn't aligned, that they are going to be like right on top of them when they first come in from like an MDR, STR perspective, and then put them through a very personalized funnel that everyone is aligned on, then you just might have wasted your opportunity with this like perfect, perfect prospect. So I think the the, the key is, again, communication. I'm a total broken record, but sitting down with your sales teams as much as possible, at least, you know, I would do it you know, once a month to say, what are you hearing on these calls? In addition to always be sharing insights and like a dedicated Slack channel, anything else that you can do to make sure you're always communicating what the objections and what the pain points are. I think I'll just keep everybody on the same page. And then just listening, just, you know, have lunch and learns, like sit down like once a month and figure out what, you know, what the other team is doing and what you can be doing to support them, I think is is really important. It's it's more about winning together. It's a lot more fun when you do that, in my opinion, in my opinion and experience. It's a lot more fun when you win together than if you try to separate and, and take the credit for everything. You know, that reminds me of a mantra that I've heard and and have lived by or have tried my best to live by which is like it's not winning unless we win together right what does it matter if you like made a bunch of money or became the leader of some group or something right some sort of like achievement in society if you had to burn down society to get there right you, yes. you didn't you didn't win, right? Um, for me, that's not winning. And so I think one of the the awesome parts of winning as a team is to look to your side or in your Zoom these days, right? Or, or Slack or whatnot, and and look at your colleague and say, you know what? We uh we did this together. You know, this this was a collective win and seeing their enthusiasm and excitement and for us in sales and marketing to be able to look at our sales or marketing counterpart and say you know what we crushed the numbers we did it we had all the the odds were against us right we had all the the challenges but we were able to to get this thing done and we've been able to build this together and i think from a startup perspective i know you're a startup junkie like myself i've been through a couple exits and i remember there was one specific exit that that uh that I went through and I remember just all of us, we were sitting there when, uh, when it went through and we were, you know, throwing a party and all that good stuff in downtown San Francisco, but it was not about my individual win, right? It was, it was really again about the team and, and our CEO was one of my best friends. Uh, I was really proud of him because he, did things at the end, and this is a bit of a tangent, but I think I think people will get the concept here that I'm trying to, you know, articulate, which is he did things like he made sure that everyone got equity and 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 got great deals, right? That mm -hmm. no one was left behind. Cause you know, sometimes the corp dev teams would try to cut the fat and what they perceive as fat and stuff like that. And um, thing areas of the business personnel that are maybe capital inefficient. And he was like, no, it's it's either all of us or none of us. And we ended up having this great exit to Twitter and which was a great brand and et cetera, pre-IPO. And and we were all very happy. And and I think, you know, the leadership team was able to look at each other and say, we did this, but we did this. Uh, as a team. So even the SDRs, you know, I used to run the sales development team there. They, even those folks, right, who are junior entry level, whatnot, they were taken care of. And, and I think that's the epitome of winning as a team. And you feel really good and you can sleep at night knowing that, that you've, you've done the, what you believe is the right thing. So, you know, just for the sales and marketing teams out there, I think uh, something that hopefully you take something from that story and, and what Julia has been mentioning ar around, you know, really being able to win as a team and, and align and why that's so critical beyond just, 
hitting your number, but it's critical for you as a human to feel good. Even if it's not obvious, try it and, and you'll see. <laughs> that's, that's actually a really good uh, segue into what I was going to ask you next, which was like cultivating a, a positive culture at a startup, right? What tips would you give go to market leaders you mentioned meeting having like regular meetings with each other and things like that especially in a remote world or hybrid worlds uh these things are a little a, a little different and you know we tend to have perhaps colleagues that are in different regions etc even different countries in some cases right how would you th- recommend that leaders think about this and and even in a world where maybe budgets are tight i think this is where i've seen people going oh i don't know if we want to spend on this offsite or whatever mm-hmm. my personal opinion is, is that it is an absolute need right you can't spend on tech and strategies and ads and blah 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 if you're not st- spending on the humans right uh, that just doesn't make sense to me yeah definitely a different ball game right than a few years ago when you know i was personally working in an office with a wonderful really collaborative culture all kinds of offsites all kinds of different activities and fun trips and everything else and that was great but it is a lot harder once you go remote so i think you know the last exit that i actually had it sounds pretty similar to your experience it was a great story to hear whereas i think like the the team felt connected and collaborated with each other through i think we did one offsite during the year and a bit that i was there and then in addition you know we did kind of regular um you know non work activities with each other and they're not compulsory but it's like it is culture building right but like ultimately none of that again really matters unless you're listening to each other at a more human level so i think the easiest way to foster a really positive culture is to just do just that just just listen and be a kind human being and have you know an experimental mindset uh, a growth mindset where you know you're willing to say okay we can try this project let's do that but let's have some real parameters set up around if it's successful or not that way we can say hey try this you should try this marketing like this fun campaign but guess what if it doesn't go well it's not just going to be a running sieve that's going to make sales you know feel uh, you know like marketing is doing its job and make finance not happy for spending that money it's going to be something where you say we tried this together it didn't quite meet the mark we can kind of cross that off the list and we can do something else so i think the the more that you can go into it with a collaborative growth mindset and really feel like we're here to learn we're here to grow and also just being transparent so like this is so underrated but like marketing and you know sales and everyone else and leadership at times like if you're not communicating those goals really clearly from the very beginning about are we looking to be acquired are we looking to be um you know are we looking to be uh bootstrapped any of these different things like that all has to be really clearly communicated um from like step 1 because if i have a founder that you know is really hoping to like you know be acquired and i'm still thinking we're going to be like our own brand forever like i'm going to be building in a completely different direction so i think that is very important as well awesome and a, a different direction and a different pace right cuz right. i think uh that's one thing that that i've uh, experienced myself it's like when the mandate is hey we're trying to sell this thing quick everyone knows it we all understand the odds and and that also points out the importance of transparency i think within the leadership team across the entire organization so awesome julia thank you so much for taking the time to chat today i really had a great time if folks wanted to learn more about air traffic control maybe follow you and your content what are the best channels or urls to reach you yep well we live on linkedin um so you can search for me julia went on linkedin um air traffic control also lives on linkedin of course uh we also have a podcast called the altitude adjustment on youtube um and our website where all those things you can link out to is www.airtrafficcontrol.io and thank you so much for having me it was a great conversation Absolutely and real quick maybe you can give a, just a, a quick summary again of what air traffic control does and why B2B marketers need it. 
Well, air traffic control sits in between HubSpot and your content, and it allows you to send out really effortlessly personalized content journeys for anyone in your database. So if you're a HubSpot customer and you've invested in content, then you should definitely give us a look. Totally free to sign up. Check it out. See if you like it. If not, tell us to go kick dirt. It's all good. <laughs> awesome. Well, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.